Fishes use. Uh, I think it's very cozy. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes, not like a very geometric discussion, but something we'll go perhaps we should discuss the episode. But we did very careful of the Yeah, there's one thing that's not Garden of Lydia and Ross. It's behind you. No, it's all right. Yes. <laughs> no, that's okay. I don't think really that's all right. I, I don't know where it went.
I need to be well, that's uh, I told you, I was in the life, but only doing one lecture in France. And was like, well, I should be Because it's one of those classic conferences in Paris. And I thought, if I don't finally give a lecture in France, it's very terrible. The first classic conference I could have then the next is super fantastic. The moment of it, I say that. I've been working with the students the day. So I think the I don't know if you like the So every time I go to Spain, I get my say, I must talk about it. I say, I'm going to have an instrument in the I think yesterday I was So if you were to the exhibition, Okay. Yes, good evening and welcome uh, welcome to this event. Uh, I want to say a few words uh, on behalf of the publisher, Skira. I, I will speak in English because I see we are all we are all very international this evening. So um, we are here to celebrate uh, the book launch uh, of Stefan Gierowski's um, first uh, really international comprehensive monograph. Uh, and on this occasion, uh, sorry, several leading specialists have joined us from uh, around the world. Uh, from left to right, we have uh, Dr. Um, Marek Bartelik, forgive the pronunciation, uh, Dr. David Anfam, uh, Natalia Gierowski, uh, Michel Gauthier, uh, Pepe Carmel. And joining us from New York, we have Dr. Joaquim Pissarro. Uh, welcome virtually to this event. Um, and just before I... I um, I pass the word to, to our experts. I really um, 
want to say a few words about the book, which I invite you to to look at on uh, at the end of the panel on your on your way out. So uh, Skira had the honor of publishing this book uh, with Stefan uh, Gierowski, uh, this leading representative of uh, uh, of, of the avant garde uh, of the twentieth century, and. Um, Stefan Gierowski, he played a huge role in, 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 in realizing this publication. Um, he was really involved in supervising all its aspects and really also helped develop uh, the table of contents of the book. Uh, so it came also as a, a very sad and uh, unpleasant surprise when we learned of his passing in August. Um, but in Skira, we were, you know, really happy and honored to have had the opportunity to do this fabulous book with him uh, while he was still alive. And it really uh, represents uh, his, um, his identity as an artist and his vision. I really want to thank the foundation uh, of Stefan Gierowski, which is represented here today by Lukas Dibalski and uh, Natalia Gierowski. Thank you for your you know, invaluable partnership uh, and uh, your excellent coordination. And there's a few other people I would like to thank, um, in particular, uh, Alicia Kobsa also uh, for her um, help in developing the layout of this book. Uh, I will not um, keep you any longer. I will now pass the word to, to our specialists. And I wish you a very inspiring and an educative evening learning more about this very significant but uh, underrepresented artist. Well, good evening. Uh... Thank you for this wonderful introduction. Thank you for the invitation uh, to Wukash and Natalia and the Giroski Foundation. My name is Marek Bartelik. I'm uh, one of the panelists, and I guess uh, you will hear from me more uh, later. Right now, I would just want to say that it's a, it's a fantastic occasion to participate in, in this kind of event. I've been involved uh, with, uh, with Polish art for last uh, maybe 35 years. Uh, I live in New York. Uh, I'm based in New York, but I'm Polish born. And it's wonderful to see the, the transition from a very marginal kind of interest to a major, uh, well, maybe not major interest, but enough interest. And with this publication, I think it will definitely uh, help to generate more. I think uh, Stefan Gierowski is a fascinating character, a fascinating artist uh, internationally, somebody who, based in Poland, was able to uh, get involved with uh, dialogue, uh, very personal dialogue with painting, but also a dialogue with, uh, with the international uh, art scene. And I think we'll hear more about this from our speakers. So without spending too much time, because I'm sure you want to hear those wonderful presentations, and then we'll have time to, to talk. Uh, first, we'll discuss uh, among us, and then later, of course, uh, you will have a zillion of questions, I'm sure. So uh, the first speaker that will um, uh, talk to you is uh, Dr. Uh, Joaquin Pizarro. No, it's... Uh, <laughs> Well, he has to wait. <laughs> I guess. Uh, I guess New York. It's it's still early, right? It says uh, it's what it's noon or something like that. It's <laughs> one o'clock. So it's Natalia Gierowska who is uh, uh, who is running the the, the Gierowski Foundation, and herself, she's a, a, a very, uh, I guess, accomplished already, despite her young age, uh, a writer. I, uh, it's who bridges in a way two two different fields because uh, she she has a scientific mind and she has an artistic mind. So uh, I guess uh, tonight she will appear in more her artistic kind of dress. So she will talk about uh, a little bit about uh, her grandfather and about uh, uh, his sort of uh, involvement with art and and uh, and her personal view. I guess that's what will be most interesting for us, uh, everything else you will find from the book. So, but uh, 
So okay. I pass the microphone to you and uh, here we go. Well, I'm, unfortunately, I'm not wearing a dress today, but I'm wearing a try my best to, to assume my artistic role for the night. Um, and it's an incredible pleasure to sit amongst the world's leading art critics and curators and discuss the life and of, of Stefan Gierowski, my grandfather, whilst at a casa that once belonged to Leonardo da Vinci. I'm highly moved and thrilled that this project has materialized. And I thank you all for joining us. Um, I thank you. I thank the publishers of Skira for giving us an excellent topic for discussion today. And a huge thanks to, to the Brooklyn Rail who is streaming this discussion today and then enabling those who um, didn't manage to join us physically to be here with us. Um, but my role today will be very different to that of the remaining panelists um, who have each prepared brilliant presentations about brilliant critical presentations about Gierowski. Uh, as a granddaughter, my presentation seeks to introduce you to Gierowski's life and contextualize today's discussion by situating his production in a broader socio and political setting. I will also shed light on his most imperative beliefs, which he shared with me during the numerous discussions we've held. Um, and I hope that you will, this will enable you to connect with him and his art on a more personal level. And in that sense, I will assume the role of Gierowski's messenger um, for the night. And I'm extremely sad that he's not here with us. Um, so without further ado, let us begin and start from the beginning. Stefan Gierowski was born in 1925 in Częstochowa, a city in southern Poland, to a doctor and a gardener. He painted from his early years, and that was met with great enthusiasm from uh, his parents, who recognized the importance of art and the importance it carries to society. After all, Stefan's father was to turn to Gierowski's word, a talented, very talented painter who also collected art from the neighboring town of Kielce. However, he decided to, not to pursue uh, painting um, and turned, devoted himself to medicine to guarantee financial stability for the family. Gierowski, for that reason, believed that it is his role to fill out the painterly gaps his father left behind. As a young boy um, living in, in Częstochowa, he derived inspiration from his, um, from his surroundings. Characteristics for Kielce was its 17th century architecture, palace architecture, and the Świętokrzyskie Mountains, um, often anglicized to the Holy Cross Mountains, which enveloped the, the, the city in question. And although modest in size, the mountain range is one of the oldest in Europe and studded with many secrets, he would say. Um, as whether he was talented, my grandfather would always humbly reflect. I was not as talented and gifted as my father, but painting is known to us from prehistoric times and therefore it is something human. And I engaged in something that belongs to our species that is interesting to our, to our kind. So before the outbreak of World War II, the young painter uncovered and subsequently became enthralled with Italian Renaissance art which is what suffuses today's meeting uh, at the Casa degli Atelani, an architect architectural masterpiece emanating from the Italian Renaissance period with a very special symbol symbolic importance, which I'm sure he would recognize. Um, he would say that until he enrolled at the Krakow Academy of Fine Art, he wholeheartedly believed that the art of the Renaissance of artistry, that it's the only truth we should, uh, that we should all strive to work towards. At the time, the Polish art scene was dominated by realistic painting. And everything seemed to point in one direction. Figuration is the only way to avoid creation. Kierowski spent his detrimental years growing up against the backdrop of World War II that showed no mercy for Poland. Cursed by its geography, Poland's flatlands, surrounded by much stronger and relentless power-hungry empires, meant that blood was shed cheaply. In 1939, Poland gets invaded by the Nazis and the artist joins the resistance. Um, ca uh, continuing the uh, patriotic tradition of his um, forefathers, a bourgeoisie family with uh, roots in the landed gentry, who are active agents in the majority of Poland's independence struggles, starting from the Napoleonic Wars until the 19th century uprisings or the war that resurrected Polish states fought against Soviet Russia in the 1920s after being removed from the European map for 123 years. And as the conspiration work demanded more attention and dedication, painting had to, painting had to move to the peripheries of Gierowski's activities. 
But the war, war finally ended in 1945, as we all know, and heavily wounded Poland began healing. And so that's its socio and political and cultural fabric. Gerowski with the end of the war and was the Krakow Academy in Five Nights. Krakow, a city which to a much lesser extent than the capital, uh, was torn by the conflict. And before it, it was known as the artistic nucleus of the country. The students began their studies by restoring the academy um, they, that they found in the state of despair to its old glory um, as the leading art university of Poland, together with its sister campus in Warsaw, where Gierowski was a professor between 1961 and 1996, later on in his life. But soon enough, there is a new battle on the horizon, one against the control and terror apparatus of which the provenance could be traced to nowhere else but the Kremlin. Um, Poland, liberated from Nazi Germany, was soon to find itself in the Soviet sphere of influence. And although it was never part of the USSR, it fell into a category of a satellite state and a buffer zone. My grandfather, nevertheless, was optimistic. He said that the Russians came, as always, they will leave, and we will build Poland. In the year following the signing of the Paris Peace Treaty, Poland found respite from the horrors it saw by finally seeing something pleasant. That is, magazines with the reproductions of the most notable artistic inventions of the time, such as Picasso, that penetrated the less desirable side of the Uh, that pronounced the introduction of the socio-political and aesthetic doctrine of socialist realism, the only officially accepted art form, something my panel successor, Joachim, will speak about in detail. So these, developed, th these developments forced all of those who subscribe to the to avant-garde and more modern thinking into the uh, under, artistic underground, and with that, my grandfather. Despite that, he knew that he's supposed to search for something modern, but what were the exact parameters of this modernity that we're talking about? This he was unsure of. He blamed the years directly after the announcement of socialist realism, which was an element in the wider effort to roll out Stalinization in Poland for obstructing this search. But worry not, he soon reached that point in 1957. And 1957 is the day that marks the date of his first abstract painting. And to distance himself from his intentions and intercept any possible misunderstandings that may arise when the public is um, exposed to his paintings, he started to give each work um, the uh, title consisting of the word picture, which in Polish means both image and a painting, and a consecutive number expressed in Roman numerals. And in that he shifts the responsibility uh, of interpreting the painter away from the artist and towards the public. Um, and in that he wishes to test the limits of all of us, all of our imagination. But in an interesting paradox, Gierowski didn't recognize himself as an abstract painter. Why, you may ask. I mean, his, his paintings could be possibly more abstract. Well, this is because his paintings do not contain abstract intellectual concepts in them. He turns to physics to elaborate on this, um, on this thought further. The painting consists of matter. It is tangible and earthly. However, something happens beyond the painting, outside the canvas, and this is where the abstraction exists and begins. It is at the very start of his abstract ex explorations that he delineated the overarching principles that he wished to explore, and that is space, light, line, matter, and color. And for over six decades, these remained the same. They were a constant, and Gierowski wished to capture a concept that would transcend the um, linguistic capacity of speech, um, such as infinity, death, or happiness. And while the scope of his explorations might appear restrictive on the surface, Gierowski never hit an originative impasse, as he would systematically tackle the same long-established questions from various angles, whilst never settling for absolute answers. And he would say, a day without painting is a day lost. And I'm sure many of us here had made broken promises that we once made to ourselves. Mm -hmm. However, not Gierowski. He truly lived by this mantra and he painted until his final day when he died age 97, almost exactly three months ago today.
with that said, Joachim. Introduce him or... Yes, we need Sorry, an introduction okay. from the moderator. Well, we probably don't need an introduction, but we'll, we'll have a very brief one. So Joaquin Pizarro is an art historian, theoretician, curator, educator, and director at, uh, at the Hunter College Galleries. And he, I believe he also teaches at Hunter College. Uh, he has held various positions at museums um, as important as... Uh, uh, Kimball Art Museum, MoMA, Philadelphia Museum, and so on. And uh, he's the author of many books, uh, important books. Uh, one of them is Pioneering Modern uh, Painting, Cezanne and Pizarro, 1865 to 1885. And the latest creation is, uh, uh, is um, uh, a book titled Wild Art, which has been co-authored with an art critic, David Carrier, and was published by Fidon uh, 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 lately, I guess. So uh, here it's a short introduction and uh, straight from New York, it's uh, Dr. Pizarro. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to, can you, can you hear me? Yes. Is the sound okay? Yes. Yep. <laughs> it's absolutely lovely to be with you virtually. I recognize a few friends. Pepe, David, Natalia, of course, thank you for, for having me here and a delight to be, uh, to be with you tonight. Uh, there is perhaps just a small technical question. Um, the person who's helping me to put this presentation together, Rebecca, needs to be let in by the host. Is that, I see, that, I see her name on the screen. Is that done already? Yeah. It's done. I, I need the host, she says to me, to let me screen share. Okay. She has to be a co-host. Yes. I see. So I'm, I'm just going to say a few words about what I, I'm uh, very uh, thankful to Natalia's remarks and what I want to, uh, from the start, very emphasize that I am not uh, like many of you, uh, a specialist of Jarovsky's work. I adore his paintings and that is perhaps the reason why Natalia kindly asked me to, to join this great panel. But what I'm proposing to do um, today is to speak a little bit about what I know more about, which in part what I'm teaching, in fact, uh, at Hunter this semester, which is the history of the long trajectory of Soviet and post-Soviet uh, abstraction or non-abstraction or the demise of abstraction. Anyway, so it's a long story and its counterpart on the uh, other side of the world in America. And uh, what I find fascinating to uh, announce uh, exactly where I will be going is the uh, way uh, Stefan Jarowski navigates among these very choppy waters, one may say, so uh, with so much, with such great elegance, serenity. And I, I love the words that I had not read or heard before that uh, Natalia quoted uh, and the, the insistence on, uh, on Jarowski's human or humane approach to abstraction. So let's look at the context within which uh, Jarowski developed as a young painter and then as, a, as an abstract painter uh, shortly thereafter. Can, can you, um, Rebecca, yes. So as, as opposed to the image that you see, uh, what I'm going to, I'm going to couch very, for, for the sake of time, I have to take a few shortcuts, but my point is that um, abstraction pretty much is born there are other competing countries, but basically it becomes the fatherland of abstraction very early on. It is concomitant with the birth of the revolution. And uh, what I would like to, uh, that, that everyone knows, but my point here is that the relationship between uh, abstraction in Russia just prior to the demise of the last empire, Nikolai II, and, um, and the revolution, the Bolshevik revolution, is a, what you might call an unrequited love story. Uh, the revolution, uh, um, I'm sorry, the abstract artists love the revolution, but the revolution doesn't give this love back. Very, so what can we move? Um, so I just want to, to show, I titled this the cause of abstraction because in Russia, very quickly, uh, whichever group, subgroup, circle, counter circle, there were all kinds of fractions and anti-fractions, but they all saw themselves as embodying the cause of the revolution through abstraction. I love this photograph of uh, 
of um, Kazimir Malievich and, and his best uh, student job right underneath. So Malievich is the one with a hat right at the center who's holding uh, uh, some tondo, abstract, abstract tondo and pointing out with his right arm some slogan above which is a replica of the black square. And to the, the, to the very top, you see a guy who's holding some kind of little uh, shibboleth, some, some kind of, it's almost like a medal. And it's, it's in fact a reduction of the famous black square that becomes uh, something like a flag of abstraction or of the cause of abstraction in its absoluteness. So let's move forward. And so I love here the, 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 the analogy between those two gestures, the way Malievich, I mean, of course, this is completely serendipitous and Lenin sort of declare, declare this is the title of, of the, this title type painting by Serov to your right, Lenin declaring Soviet power, well, to the left, you have Malievich declaring the uh, suprematist power, declaring the power of the, of, the, of the black square, the power of abstraction, couching it within absolute terms. As I said, this will be a sad story and one that is absolutely unrequited. Let's keep going. So this is a painting I love, which is in the um, Art Institute in Chicago, depicting through abstract terms, through abstract vocabulary of a football game. Football, not to be understood in the American sense, of course, but I know I'm speaking to Europeans mostly. Let's keep going. Uh, so uh, it's interesting that this, uh, there's 30 years basically that separate uh, the birth of abstraction, 30 years or so in the Soviet Russia and Jarovsky and several of his peers who uh, venture into the field of abstraction right at the uh, end of World War II, uh, beautifully and sadly de de described by Natalia in, in a few uh, tragic words uh, just a few minutes ago. So let's keep going because I'm, I'm aware of, um, so I just love the, the quote, Jerovsky is, I sadly did not know him, but um, th through uh, his granddaughter today, we are really, I feel very much in touch with him. I find he's, um, his painting's great, of course, but the, the way he writes is also so captivating. And again, um, so I think this is a, a quote that you referred to, um, Natalia. Um, the, here's a kind of existential point in his life where he decide, he has to decide whether he's going to continue to work in the resistance or to go and learn. And he decides to, to do the, the, the latter. I decided to do the latter. The Russians came, the Russians will leave, and we will rebuild our country. Uh, very moving statement. So keep going, Rebecca. So I'm just going to show you um, a few works that are sort of tangential, so showing you the transition from uh, his uh, representative years, uh, representational years, sorry, to uh, into abstraction. La putain respectueuse is the, the title of a play by Sartre, very important moment, I think of 1946. Uh, that led to a film, to, a, to a, of course, several theater representation and fascinating play, but we don't have to go into it right now. So let's keep going. And what I find extremely interesting here, as I said, I will argue here that Jarowski navigates very peacefully and very serenely among those very high stakes, choppy waters of abstraction being declensed and uh, on, on either side, on the east and the west. And it's interesting that uh, despite the threat, which I believe was real, of uh, the uh, of the socialist realism uh, project was that began actually not so much with Stalin, but already with Lenin. Lenin was definitely uh, bored to tears by abstraction and contributed to the early demise of the uh, avant-garde project already in the 1920s, before he died in 1924. Of course, Stalin maximizes this, and in the 30s, uh, it is quite obvious that abstraction has not a, le a leg to stand on. So the socialist realism project in the USSR is absolutely uh, huge, and, and I find it very interesting that Jarovsky has no um, sort of acrimony, no vengeance, no, there's nothing, my attempt to reconcile with socialist realism failed. But you know, this is this, this human um, way of tackling with these enormous powers on, on both sides. Um, 
the USSR and the USA. So let's look at the next slide so that you see a little bit the brick wall against which Jarovsky failed. No bad pun intended. Um, an extreme version of socialist realism coexisted with a stern version of Stalinism and all of its consequences. It became stuffy, the atmosphere was heavy, even silly jokes were met with prison. And that's a little bit what I'm going to see. But I'm also going to show you how, uh, I meant the, the context between right and left, east and west, how abstraction very quickly, in fact, at this very particular point, uh, moves uh, to the United States and becomes an, the, itself a flag of the ideology held by the US, the State Department organizers, uh, exhibitions abroad where the, the abstract expressionists are uh, the, sort of holding the flame of what uh, liberty, freedom, capitalism, uh, all the propaganda tools of the other side uh, consist of. Okay, let's keep going. So this is the kind of socialist realism that we see uh, everywhere during the 1950s uh, throughout the world from Cuba to, uh, uh, to Warsaw to, to, uh, to Moscow and indeed after 1949 in, in Beijing. Let's keep going. And what I do find fascinating, this, this image apparently is lost. I you know, uh, Natalia knows there of its whereabouts, but uh, this is the, the illustration of what Jarovsky uh, describes when he says, I tried to reconcile myself with socialist realism. So this, I find this, this, this work, uh, so wish we could actually see it uh, fascinating. Um, and of course it was probably, it was rejected. So this is the, the end of the road of this attempt to reconcile himself with socialist realism. Let's keep going. And I find these uh, plays, these uh, morphic um, uh, declensions of geometric figures that become more almost like uh, human organs, absolutely fascinating. Let's keep going. And that's the background again. So I'm going to try to articulate what, uh, what it is that Jarovsky and his peers would be seeing as representing the official artistic voice uh, accepted at the time. Let's keep going. Of course, this is the depiction of the Korean War, I should have said, yes. Um, um, so yes, this is, uh, uh, so the, the period between 51, 52 uh, and 54 is a very important point. This is uh, indeed a groundbreaking uh, exhibition that takes place uh, here, the war against, against war against fascism, uh, referred to as the Arsenal exhibition. Uh, and, um, and again, uh, this is what Jarovsky uh, describes as a protest against, uh, it's interesting the way he phrases it. It's not a, a protest against socialist realism, which he could have very well said. Uh, no, it's a protest against certain aspects of socialist approach to art. So what I find again fascinating here is the non-absolute terms, the relative a far more humane approach to the problems uh, at stake than that we see um, happen in, in Soviet Russia or indeed in the USA. Let's keep going. Yep. So I just want to give you a sense of what happens with Jarovsky. I prefer, in fact, not to, uh, I'm intimidated with the, the panel I have, so I'm not going to step in, uh, in the shoes of you guys, specialists of his work. So let's keep going simply love this work and it's again so interesting how here this is subtle beautiful harmonious marriage uh, of sorts between uh, geometric abstraction and uh, figure figure or fig figurational uh, painting let's keep going so I, I find this text very interesting what happens in 56 a watershed and nothing had, seen, had since been the same as before. Never before had the communist authorities been in as much of favor, as much favor, however improbable this might sound. The changes proposed by Komulka, who is the premier in, in Poland, were approved by almost the whole society and the secretary general of the communist party enjoyed as much trust as no other leader. Proclaimed from a tribune, works like freedom and independence gave grounds for believing that the times of socialist realism 
would not return. Now, what we're talking about here is a very important moment, which I'm going to give you a few images of. Um, Stalin dies in 1953. It's not until 56, so that's exactly the time we're talking the, that uh, Zagrodsky here is referring to. The time referred to in Soviet Russia as the thaw, the thaw, like the, the melt, uh, the, the snow melting, and it refers to uh, Khrushchev taking power, denouncing the cult of personality by Stalin, uh, emphasizing that Soviet Russia should move on towards a more uh, reformed, liberal, more open, more freedom. The term freedom is, is beginning, beginning to be expressed. We, we talk about de-Stalinization, but in fact, this is a short-lived wave of uh, some kind of uh, lenient moment, and it returns as often with this kind of roller coaster waves. You know, the, the Soviet uh, dynamics is not a strict uh, single line authoritarian regime, it has all kinds of variations. So, we see one of them uh, and how it manifests itself in. Uh, Soviet bloc countries such as Poland, etc. Yes, and I love the fact that this particular figure, of course, uh, conjugates the, 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 to the red and white, the, the colors of the Polish flag, uh, this red, this greenish figure. So let's keep going. Let's keep going. Absolutely love this uh, this extraordinary painting. What I find fascinating, and maybe some of you will touch upon this, is that. If you see those two works, they're almost of the same year, the same date. Um, they articulate such different vocabularies already in, in the uh, field of abstraction. And you would show me those paintings without knowing anything about Jarowski. I would not necessarily be uh, tempted to say that this is the same artist. Let's keep going. So this period is uh, the period of liberalization uh, leads to, to this group of works that we, we are seeing. And so it coincides with uh, softening of the policies on the Communist Party's part. And uh, they, in parallel, you see a uh, birth, uh, birth, burst of intensi inten intensivity and creativity uh, in Jarowski's painting studio. Let's keep going. So this is what you see throughout most of the Soviet world, sort of debunking, dismantling, destruct, dis destroying of the uh, monumentalization of the, the figure of Stalin and what he stood for. But again, I don't want to let you imagine that suddenly uh, life became uh, free and easy in, in all this. It's just a matter of nuance. So let's continue. So while all this is going, this is 1958, so we are in the Thor period. Uh, here's a, a type of situation that you would see recurrently throughout the Cold War, which is a war being led on cultural ground. And you have, you have here almost side by side, I mean, they're like uh, 100, 200 meters away by foot from each other in Brussels, the, the pavilion, the, the Expo 58, the UN, UN, URSS in French, USSR in English, uh, features uh, a group of ne necessarily socialist realist paintings and uh, in the other side of the coin is the fact that the USA, uh, the State Department is involved, this is a very clear political message, uses abstract expressionism as its own flag of what it, pro that it sees as a proponent of abstract expressionism through abstraction incarnate the values that uh, the capitalist, capitalist USA society uh, extols. So let's keep going and see what kind of opposition, keep going. You see, by the, by the way, the USSR pavilion is practically uh, empty, whereas the USA pavilion is, is overcrowded. So this is the kind of uh, juxtapositions that you would see if you went from one to the other. Uh, the, what's interesting in that, in that particular moment, the, the Thor period, the USSR is uh, reminiscing. I mean, of course, the war has been absolutely devastating, 20 million victims altogether, including the, the, the purchase by Stalin in, in the USSR. I don't know the numbers in Poland, but I'm sure they are as, as atrocious. And the uh, USSR is constantly reliving uh, celebrating through memory uh, the, the big war, the heroic war, as it is called. Let's keep going. And so what I find fascinating, going back to Jarovsky's uh, own words, is the way 
uh, again, he um, uh, articulates his own vision, creation uh, artistically through the language of abstract, which by this time he has completely and fully embraced without any of the sort of roaring uh, propaganda, slogans, shibboleth, you know, uh, absolute causes that we see, uh, uh, again, East and West. Keep going. So this reads like a poem in a way, like a very simple poem, but it is all the mostly tragic events, people, individuals uh, that have marked uh, his, own, uh, his own life. Let's keep going. But what I, I, I was bringing this particular quote again, really echoing the term that uh, Natalia pronounced, the, the, the humanity. For, I don't know if uh, everybody will agree here, but uh, if we needed to give maybe a term for the type of abstraction that Jarovsky developed, I would, I would call it human, humanist abstraction, if that makes any sense. So the 34th uh, Venice Biennial is, is another key moment uh, when 1968, as you all know, uh, 68 is shaken up uh, throughout the, the whole planet. In fact, from, from Sao Paulo to Tokyo, uh, from north to south, uh, Paris being one of the epicenters with having launched uh, the series of uh, protests that turned almost into a revolution in Paris. And let's see what happens in, um, in Venice. So protests, protests against, uh, you know, the, the guy who's in the center there, you see 1964 pop art, 1968, you cannot quite read it, but it says polizia, polizia art, uh, playing on the Italian term polizia, polizia art. So they're against the way art is being uh, uh, utilized as an organ of propaganda by the, the main powers. And again, the same situation as we saw 10 years before in Brussels, we find again here incarnated in, uh, in inside Russia, in, sorry, excuse me, in Venice with the two, uh, two major pavilions, USA and USSR facing each other like, uh, like, like dogs uh, at, at uh, daggers with each other. Let's move on. And so this is another kind of uh, contrast. I could see, and I love actually the, the formal relationship and the absolute chasm in between those two, uh, those two words. Kokushka, Kokushka, sorry, is not a Soviet, uh, it's not Russian, he's Albanian. Let's move on. And again, so when you reintroduce Jarovsky's work, um, I'm not making value judgments here, but I find a, an air of serenity, I would say even of spiritual, uh, freedom and elating moments just within his own works. It's as though he is almost floating happily in between those, those uh, conflating powers, superpowers, propagandic machine, one way or the other. He's not into that. At least that's not, that's my perception. Uh, let's keep going. So the, going back to what happens to abstraction in where in its fatherland, so Infante, uh, it is an Italian name, but he is a Russian Soviet, late Soviet artist. And he's one of those artists who was part of the con uh, Moscow conceptualism period. Uh, he was one of the uh, uh, collective actions members. And so what they're looking at is the way abstraction born with much fanfare, with much uh, kudos and, and noise in the late teens, early 20s has broken down. And you know, there's absolutely, there's not even a, a single book about what happens in, in New York. They're prohibited, they're not translated. You have to smuggle them in order to get them. So they hear about what happened uh, two generations before them through the uh, broken, through, through translations, bootleg copies of art forum magazines brought in under the, the armor through, I mean, you know, through all kinds of weird ways. Abstraction has become this sort of bizarre ghost of their past and this uh, broken down, uh, quasi ridiculous buffoon uh, token of science that mean that cohere, that, that have absolutely no coherence. So let's keep going. So I absolutely love this is another group here called Gniezdo, Nest, uh, Scarcis to the left, and I forget who is to the right, Art to the Masses. 
a term borrowed from, from Lenin. And, and here is uh, David and Pham will, of course, have recognized the painting to the right, which is in Cleveland. And so they absolutely know, uh, so don't care, just rotating it to 45 degrees and turning it into some sort of ideo, ideogram, a sign of, of sort with a red banner. There's absolutely no, no meaning, no sign, except that they are protesting in the middle of the streets of Moscow. There's only two of them. They didn't get arrested, probably because the, the police thought, who are these two clowns? You know, what, it, what on earth is going on here? This is what happens to abstraction 60 years after the fact in, uh, in the streets of Moscow. Keep going. And again, Jarovsky has very little to do with this. Another sort of performance by the Moscow conceptualist um, in the late 70s. So we are reaching the end of the Soviet era and they sort of, you know, mimicking, caricaturing. Again, this, I really believe there's a lot of humor, cynical buffoonery, self-derogation about their own history and what, what has propelled abstraction to become such a vibrant thing in the West and a, and a dead thing in the East. Keep going. Similar, at the very same time, an event that changes the whole world is the arrival of the first Polish Pope in a Soviet world, in a Soviet bloc world, most, uh, excuse me, Warsaw, Poland in, uh, in effect, apparently a million plus um, uh, visitors, uh, pious uh, followers of the Pope came down in the, in the, to the street following his uh, arrival. And uh, Brezhnev, and I always forget his name, I apologize, Natalia, uh, the, the, the premier who was always wearing these dark glasses, Brezhnev turned to, uh, to the Polish premier and told him, we will never be able to reach that kind of figures ever again. This, this is the moment where we're not, Gorbachev is not even part of the picture yet, but they, the, the Soviet leaders are beginning to see the end of their, uh, the, the, their supremacy. Let's keep going. I, I know that we, and what I find fascinating is again, this, whenever you bring in Jarovsky's work here, this moment of peaceful, you want to breathe, you know, this, again, I find this, the serenity of these works absolutely astonishing. Uh, keep going. Thank you. So this happens in sync with the last years of the end of the, 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 the Soviet grip. And it's extraordinarily interesting that the leading country where this is all taking place, following, uh, I believe the, the, the visit of the Pope is, is a huge stimulus. The beginning of the idea of Solidarnosc, the first Polish word uh, I ever uh, learned, I was 2022 at this, in those years, is taking place in Poland. And this is what, is the leftovers of uh, abstraction in uh, the Soviet world. It becomes a sort of joke, it becomes a sort of pun, it becomes a sort of um, um, throwing back, very much what Heidegger would do philosophically, throwing back the two superpowers back to back, USA, USSR, just as bad as each other, just as phony, just as noisy propaganda, propaganda um, uh, you know, uh, make, mechanized by the system of propaganda, each of them in different terms. Uh, here, this, this is a joke on the commodization, uh, uh, the, the way uh, abstraction becomes sort of a, another form of a buying uh, object. Uh, let's keep going. And in between again, back to Jarovsky, who is, I find, transcending all this. Let's keep going. And so here he is, I'm just going to end with this uh, extraordinary quote, which I will read and share with you, deliverance from the object, the mimesis, does not imply deliverance from reality. And that's what I find uh, extraordinary in, in, in Jarovsky's approach, this paradox, he is a, someone anchored in reality, I mean, his, his presence, his role in the resistance in the 40s uh, speaks volumes about that. Our emotions and sensations are also part of reality. They simply exist. The very fact of painting signifies that it is not abstraction, but concrete, pure, and simple. And that's a little bit what, I mean, this is what Natalia was emphasizing about. He doesn't see his work as abstraction. And I, my point, I will leave you with this conclusion, you know, it's more like a hypothesis or maybe a question to share with you, is that perhaps 
his uh, his reticence to join in to to jump into the the soccer field of abstraction or the war games of abstraction propaganda wise is perhaps because he did not relate to either Malievich or to Barnett Newman was an anarchist himself, but to the way the State Department hijacked uh, American abstract expressionism and turned it into the counter side of the Soviet flag. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for uh, for this presentation. As I was listening to uh, to your wonderful speech, uh, I, one aspect which is very important in terms of Giroski's work is also the presence of the church in Poland, which makes it very different from Russia and other East European countries because uh, the church was a power and it was a political power. So maybe it will come in later um, um, presentations how it entered into the work of, of Giroski, because I think uh, the, 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 the state and the power of the state was one, one part of the equation. The other was uh, the, the Catholic church, which uh, with a short period of, uh, of, um, of uh, sort of, uh, oppression, which was in the 50s during the Gomuka time, the church, uh, the Polish church had very strong presence in Poland and, and, and influenced, uh, I think, art included. So we'll, 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 we'll discuss this later. Uh, next presentation uh, will be by Dr. Pepper Carmel, who is an art historian teaching at, uh, at NYU at the New York University. Um, author of many books. I, I think the, the most interesting in this context is probably Abstract Art, A Global History, which he published uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, he has written for many publications, including the New York Times, uh, Art in America, and the Brooklyn Rail, which is uh, a co-sponsor of this event. And what else? Uh, you were a curator and uh, and what's very uh, impressive also, you are a translator of French poetry, which is lovely. So here we go. Should I be using a microphone? Um, yes, probably best if you do. Do you know how to, sorry. Um, there's, um, is that the PDF or the yeah, PowerPoint? The Try, is there a little green dot up um, to the upper left? That might do it. No, we're still. Uh, technical issues. Well, if if you don't mind continuing to struggle with that, uh, let me yes. let me get started. Um, so first, I want to, get, to repeat what's already been said to thank Natalia and the foundation for inviting me to speak on this panel. Um, first, in, in part, just for the sheer pleasure of coming back to Milan, which I haven't visited in many years, and being here with all of you tonight, but also because. Uh, I didn't know about Stefan Jarowski's work, and it's been a great adventure to learn about it and to discover it. And now I think I need to do a second volume of my book on abstract art. The, the goal of that book was very much to get outside of the usual list of the same 20 or 30 artists, Malevich and Jackson Pollock and Barnett Newman, who are wonderful. But, you know, we keep hearing those names and seeing those pictures over and over again. And there are so many other great artists who deserve to be part of that story. And so an evening like this, the, the, the occasion like the exhibition that preceded this and the book that is just being published now is, is very much something I, I support. And I think it's fantastic that we are opening up this history today. And I'm happy to be here tonight to be part of it. Um, I'm going to take a somewhat political approach. I'm going to put his pictures in the context of some of the same political history that Joachim just discussed. And so I, I also want to thank in advance Marek and Natalia because I don't really know what as much as I should about this history. And I'm sure I'm going to make some terrible mistakes. And I, I look forward to the corrections that you can give me in the uh, and you know, when we get down to a discussion afterwards. Okay, so, well, if this is what we've got, this, this will be fine. Um, so I've just put in this picture of, wonderful picture of the pigeon coop with this, to launch this idea of Zhirowski taking flight. I just want to look at the very 
not the beginning years of his career. Joachim took us back farther in time than I'm going to go, but at the, the beginnings of his career uh, as an abstract artist. And if Natalia, if I can go to the next, um, thank you. Uh, I'm bringing back here a picture that Joachim already showed you. Alexander Kobstez passed me a brick which was, as, as Joachim pointed out, the approved art of the 1940s and 50s. This was, you know, classic socialist realism, an exceptionally good example of socialist realism with the sense of the labor, the joy in creating, the, the immense task of rebuilding Poland after the destruction of the war. Uh, but then by 1959, 10 years later, Kupstez was making pictures like the one on the right, uh, painting um, conflict, rather, from 1959. And this, in a sense, is, is the key story that we're looking at, is this transition from one to the other, which occurs within the work of individual artists. It's not just, you know, the Russian socialist realists versus other people making abstraction. It's a struggle that happened in the careers of individuals like Kobstez and Jirowski. Now, I want to call out a few details of the painting on the right, specifically the very muddy kind of background, uh, the sense of something in turmoil, the strong physical presence, a kind of, it's like soil or earth or paste or something, the, the surface of the canvas. Uh, and I think this uh, reflects, in a general sense, the influence of Art Informel in France, but more specifically, the model of Jean Dubuffet, who was hugely influential in the 50s and 60s all over the world, not just in France and Europe, but in the United States as well, for what the French, what he called matière, for emphasizing raw matter in paintings. He talked about his his haute pot, his heavy pace. And so Kobstez is giving us a version of that um, but there's also, it's a little hard to make out a kind of some somewhat geometrical, bilateral, frontal figure here, a kind of stiffened, formal, abstract version of a human being. Now, if we can go to the next, we can look at the, the equivalent transition in the work of Jirowski. Um, on the left is a painting that, just, that justly gets a lot of emphasis in the new book, I Love Life from 1955, with, whoops turning to the big oh place. good okay um great thank you that's wonderful um so by the time we're done we'll be really good at doing this <laughs> um no no it's it, this is normal <laughs> um okay so in the painting on the left you have these somewhat abstracted figures uh, with these very bright colors, a strong sense of modeling, a great sense of energy throughout. It's often said that um, Jurowski was influenced by Fernand Leger, and I think that's true. And it's important not just as an artistic influence, but because of Leger's political position in France. He was a very committed communist, and so he was someone who in France provided an example of how you could be modernist, avant-garde, quasi-abstract, and yet still make pictures that explicitly um, upheld the ideals of the Communist Party, which in this case had to do with the right to leisure, the right to a full weekend, the right to time off, and so forth. These had been great causes of the French left going all the way back to 1936 and then picking up again in the 1950s. Uh, I think in the in Jirowski's work on the left, there are also um, elements that seem to reflect the image of Pablo Picasso and his post-war paintings of a kind of Arcadian life on the shores of the Mediterranean. Also, I think, you know, some little bit of Marc Chagall creeping in here. Um, there is so much more research to be done to think about, you know, who to learn about, you know, which artist was he looking at? What did they mean to him? Um, this is really just feels like the beginning. Now, here on the right is a painting from just two years later, painting two, uh, as was mentioned, as Natalia mentioned, he just gave numbers to his paintings. I'm sorry, I hope I'm, I'm not blocking the image here. Uh, and this, of course, has the same uh, a muddy background similar to that which we just saw in the Club stage. Um, but the figuration is different. I'll, I'll come back to that in a moment because I want to go back to the social and political history that Joachim already started to talk about and to say a few more words about it. 
because I think that understanding this history, which is now, you know, almost um, it's about 60 years behind us, is, is essential to, we need to understand the context in which this work was made in order to see what it meant. Um, as Joachim reminded us, the suffering of Poland during World War II, the, you know, Poles of many backgrounds, Catholic, Jewish, Roma, that, you know, it was horrific. Um, there was also, of course, the, the Katyn massacre of the officer corps of the Polish army, thousands of people who were shot, something that the Soviet Union tried to blame on the Nazis, but was in fact done by the Russians on Stalin's orders. Then at the end of World War II, Poland found itself once again chopped up, moved around. The eastern part of Poland was incorporated into the USSR. 500,000 Soviet soldiers were stationed in Poland, an occupying army that remained there for some time. The western border of Poland was moved uh, west to the oder neisse line. Ethnic Germans were moved across the border, uh, which was something that happened at the same time in Czechoslovakia. There was an attempt to create ethnically homogenous countries at a tremendous human price. Within Poland itself, in 1946, although at Yalta it was decided that there would be democratic elections and so forth, um, Stalin had no interest in democratic elections, and Roosevelt and Churchill were not really in a position to oppose him over Poland. Remember, the war started with the invasion of Poland, and here they were, you know, a few years later with Poland being fought over between the, the, the victorious powers. Um, so the, Stalin supported a, a communist party that took power in 1947 to 50, they had the first of the three-year plans, which it should be said was a tremendous success. There was a fantastic growth in the national income and in output. Um, this is one of the facts about history that often gets forgotten is all those you know, five-year plans and whatnot that started in Russia in the late 20s. They worked They act at, at tremendous cost, but they actually did produce economic growth. So there's a paradox of something horrible and painful that occurs. And at, there's a tremendous human price, but there is also, in fact, an economic benefit. In 1948, Pasla Gomuka, who was the installed as the premier of Poland when, when the communists took power, was replaced by a hardliner. Stalin decided he didn't like Gomuka. Uh, he wanted someone who was more firmly under his thumb. So he was replaced by Boleslav Birut, um, and then in 1948, also same year as Joachim mentioned, the Polish Communist Party officially imposed the doctrine, the aesthetic of socialist realism. Then came the changes that Joachim alluded to in 1953, the death of Stalin in February 1906, Khrushchev's speech denouncing Stalin's crimes. But then something that is not so well known, it certainly wasn't known to me until I started researching this, is the parallels between what happened in 1956 in Poland and what happened in Hungary. In June of 1956, there were massive demonstrations by Polish workers against corruption. There were general protests. Um, and these were so intense that in October of that year, Khrushchev brought Gomulka back to power. He had been you know, banished but it was felt that he could somehow solve the situation in a way that Beirut couldn't. And then the whole, the fraughtness of the situation was intensified because also in October through November, 1956, hung, the Hungarian government rejected Soviet control. And as you know, this was followed by a Russian invasion repressing that attempt to create freedom in Hungary. So Gomulka was in a very tough spot and he arrived at a compromise, which is, I think, essential to understanding what artists could, could do and what they did do in Poland in the late 50s and the 60s. Gomułka's compromise was to clearly accept Soviet domination, domination in the political and military sphere, which avoided the kind of invasion that occurred in Hungary. But at the same time, he insisted at that point on cultural liberalization. 
It was a very, it's, you know, from the, what I've been reading about him, it was an early version of what came to be known as socialism with a human face. And of course, the, that famous term that you've already heard, a thaw. So for some years there, although there was also a thaw in the Soviet Union, for some years, in fact, artistic policy was more liberal in Poland than it was in the USSR. Now, coming back to the art, I Love Life, the painting on the left, is much more avant-garde than anything that would have been possible a few years earlier. Jirowski could not, I think, have made this painting in Poland in 1953, let's say. There was, there was already something happening in 55. Um, but then, of course, the painting on the right seems to me in its in its abstraction, in its rad radical nature, its change reflects the what happened with Gamulka's return to power and this new liberalization of culture that happened after 1956. Uh, if we could go to the next one, please. So here I want to point out the extent to which the background of Jarowski's painting, the painting number two on the right, is similar to the dark gray, very physical, um, paste-like nature of Kostej's painting on the left. On the left, that this was a way of ex this seems to me to have not exactly a political meaning, but a, a a sense about life, a kind of existential meaning. It's, it's a crude and dirty form of figuration, um, and as I mentioned earlier, I think it shows the influence of artists like Jean Dubuffet and also the Italian artist Alberto Burri, who was extremely important in these years. Um, there's also an intersection at this time, in the late 50s to the early 60s, between political discussions and artistic discussions. There's a political discussion group called, uh, translated into English, the Club of the Crooked Circle. And Marek, instead of me masquering this, can you... <laughs> Thank you. Because it, when it's written out in letters, it doesn't look anything like that. <laughs> Um, this was a comp this was a, you know, a group of intellectuals who got together to talk about philosophical and political issues. Um, at the, this was accompanied by the creation of an art gallery managed by an artist named Marian Bogush or Boskuski. Bogush, yes, thank you. Um, which showed Jirowski and other artists. So, you know, there is an artistic counterpart to what's going on, quite literally, to what's going on in the intellectual sphere. Now, if we could advance again, thank you. Um, it's also important to look at the figuration in this painting, in the Jirowski on the right, these sort of stick figures who are very geometric. And it seems to me that they probably come in part from the example of Paul Clay and drawings like the one on the left. And there's there's a whole different story, I mean, you know, a whole different lecture to be given here on Paul Clay in the post-war era. I think Clay was an artist who seemed to, so to speak, square the circle, to be abstract and figurative at the same time. And for instance, when Okwe and Wezor did his great post-war show a few years ago, in Munich, uh, there was a whole room full of artists from all over the world who were picking up on Paul Clay in the post-war era. So that way of being abstract and figurative, of being socially concerned, but also avant-garde and formal is, is something that Clay sort of opened up a path to do that in a way that deserves further explanation. Now, if we could go forward again to look at a different change, between 1957 and 58, it appears that Jarowski's work didn't shift so much in terms of composition, but did shift in a very important way in terms of color. The painting on the left is sort of, you know, gray and I mean, a little dab of green, but it's a kind of grim, you know, existential Jean-Paul Sartre, no exit feeling set of colors. Uh, and on the right, suddenly we get these, you know, reds and blues descending with, um, you know, bursts of materiality, kind of bits of impasto, and the whole thing is feels very joyful in terms of color, um, even though the composition is similar. Now, at this point, I want to shift the scene, if we go forward again, thanks, uh, to New York. Uh, in 1961, there was a major exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art in New York called 15 Polish Painters. 
And as Marek was explaining to me yesterday, this was very much a reaction to the meeting the previous year of the Art Critics, International Art Critics Association, of which you were later the, the head for quite some years. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> that was noble service to the field. Um, in any case, there was a groundbreaking meeting of art critics in Poland in 1960, which was a, a sort of landmark of cultural and intellectual collaboration across the Iron Curtain. And it appears that this awoke an interest in New York amongst New York curators in Polish art. And so Peter Seltz from the Modern went to Poland, looked at a lot of art and came back and did this show, 15 Polish painters. But something, um, a further detail, uh, the, you know, the painting on the left, a, a formal point is it's a black and white reproduction. The catalog is all in black and white. There's one frontispiece that's in color, but everything else is black and white as it used to be in old catalogs. So the painting looks very gray. But given the date of it, which is 1958, my guess is that it actually looked much more like the painting on the right. I'm guessing that it was blues and reds or other bright and more cheerful colors. So, you know, you have to be aware of the effect of black and white on what you think you're seeing. But I also want to make a point here about the human systems, the economic systems that, that bring, you know, painting to our attention. As, as noted below there, the, that painting, in fact, both of the Jarowskis in that exhibition in 1961 were lent to the show by a gallery called the Gallery Chalet, which had been founded by two Polish refugees, Madeleine Chalet and Arthur Lejois. And their public exhibition program began with Kandinsky, Malevich, Arp, Chagall, Matisse, Picasso, and Leger, sort of famous big names of um, the 20th century, of European 20th century art. They then shifted to European abstraction in the constructivist tradition and helped build that collection of constructivist art uh, the, at the Museum of Modern Art. I think this leads up to Magdalena Dabrowski's work, which we were also talking about earlier, as she was a curator at the Modern in later years. Um, but they seem to have privately collected, put together a very important collection of Polish, contemporary Polish art. And so once again, a subject for further research, what exactly you know, were the chalets collecting what, you know, which artists were they interested in? What became of their collection afterwards? I think these are very important issues, you know, things we need to know. If we could go forward again. Uh, another artist who was in the show in 15 Polish Painters in 1961 was Wojciech, another well, Polish artist, 15 Polish artists, was um, Wojciech Fangor. Uh, who has made a kind of breakthrough in the United States in the last five or six years. He's a, He's been exhibited, there have been books and articles, so I hope that he's opened up a path that is now going to be followed by Stefan Jarowski in terms of regaining public recognition. And let me emphasize that word regaining. You know, there's often the sense, at least in the United States, that we're living in the first era of global art and you know we americans have never been interested in anything except american art and oh my goodness you mean there was art in poland and <laughs> india <laughs> this is simply is not true in the 1950s and 60s there was tremendous awareness of art from europe in new york there was tremendous awareness of art from europe of art indeed from all around the world we went to a kind of amnesia and chauvinistic closing of the mind in the late 60s and 70s. And we are only now, all these years later, we Americans recovering from that closing of the mind and beginning to open up to things that our parents and grandparents knew perfectly well if they were paying attention to art. But there's a further point I want to make by showing you Fangor's work here on the right which is that both he and Jarowski at this moment shift their formats. I think, uh, yes, Joachim already showed the, the painting on the right, a uh, painting um, 56 from 1961. There's a shift that seems to, that unifies both of these artists, and I suspect other ones, which is a shift to a symmetrical frontal image, to a kind of geometric simplification, instead of putting together asymmetrical complex forms, there's this centered, you know, one single very powerful image. In this case, I'm obviously 
stack the deck by picking two paintings of circles. Uh, this is, you know, has important affinities with what's leading towards minimalism and so forth in the United States is this desire for something simple and symmetrical and tremendously powerful. Um, why does this happen? This is a mystery. I don't have an answer to this, but I just want to make the question clear. Was there a general change of paradigm? Was it a kind of version of constructivism replacing the more complex forms of our informel? Is this therefore a Polish parallel to what was happening at the time in, or had been happening in Brazilian and Argentinian constructivism? There, there are just so many questions here about global art, about global movements. that are not just what art in one country, but art in many countries. I do want to point out about the Jirowski here, more than the Fanger, um, this painting retains a sense of texture, a sense of the material facture. Fanger is moving towards a kind of dematerialized opticality. Uh, this was a big thing in the United States in the 1960s. And indeed, his work really becomes part of the international op art movement, is recognized as part of that starting around 62, 63, and, and so forth, which is something that Jirowski is not part of. His paintings always have this sense of texture of the world i feel there it's like you know if you're standing in a garden and you reach down and you pick up a handful of dirt they're always rooted in the earth in a sense in a way that many artists of the time uh, are not uh, another important event of 1961 is that he joins the this is stressed in the book that this is the year when he joins the faculty of the academy of fine arts in warsaw Teaching in the department, which, and I think this is not a coincidence, is headed at that time by Alexander Kobzdej. So another connection among these artists uh, whose parallels have already been pointing out. Uh, if we could go forward again, please. Now, one of his Jirowski's best known pictures from the mid 60s is this one on the right painting um, 160, I guess, which is also known as Strike. So a, a title snuck in there. Uh, and there seems to be this bullet-like form intruding from the left that feels as if it were hitting a field of parallel bars that were all upright originally, but as the bullet-like form hits them, they are all bent and distorted in curves moving to the right, and then the light modulates from light to dark, representing something, evoking something like the violence of this impact. Um, it, it's been observed that this is very similar to a contemporary image, a famous photograph by uh, the stop time photographer, Harold Edgerton, of a bullet going through an apple. But in fact, it reminds me of a much older photograph, the one on the left, which is by the German scientist Ernst Mach, a bullet with a shockwave. This is a photograph taken as scientific documentation, not as art, but as, as a scientific document in 1896. Uh, Mach was a famous physicist and a science writer, an enormously popular writer on science, but also a pioneer in the study of shock waves, which, you know, we just take as, you know, you all are the phrase shock waves. Um, these are a little mysterious in terms of physics. They are produced when an object like a bullet or for that matter, a supersonic airplane flies faster, moves faster through a medium like air then sound waves can travel through that medium. So instead of the energy just kind of going in a nice gentle wave, it emerges as a wave edge that is breaking. A shock wave can actually literally break things when it hits them. And it certainly is unpleasant to hear. That's why they got rid of supersonic airplanes. Um, this was an idea that had a great deal of currency at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, it's the probable source for the idea of shell shock in World War I. You know, there was this phenomenon of soldiers who were not physically harmed, but the, the, the psychic experience of being there in the trenches under artillery fire, which tragically is something that's happening right now. That experience, the psychological trauma, was something that psychologists were struggling to understand, and they coined this phrase of being shocked by shells. But why shock? I think they were borrowing this concept from physics, from Aaron Smock, to describe something psychological. Now, if we could advance again, thank you. This, I think, had 
it's the source for a lot of imagery in the work of the Italian futurists, such as Luigi, Luigi Russolo here on the left. This is his dynamism of an automobile from 1912-13. The futurists, however, <clears throat> saw shock as something good. They felt that European civilization and Italian civilization in particular was just kind of wallowing in, you know, here you are in Milan with, you know, the you know, so much great old art, the Last Supper across the street from us, the, the amazing museum collections, the Pinoteca Brera, the Pinoteca Ambrosiana. And so I, I went to those this morning. So amazing. Um, but, you know, that it's hard to get away from the past. It's hard to become modern. And of course, here we are in Milan, the center of modernity in Italy, the place where modernity happened. And so the futurists picked this up as a good thing. Then Walter Benjamin picked this up as an idea in the famous essay, The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction in 1936. And I want to conclude by pointing out that its significance in Jarowski's work remains mysterious. Does he see this kind of shock as a generalized element in modern civilization? Is this what it feels like to be alive in the 1960s, to be subjected to a series of shocks? Uh, is it a reaction to something in particular that was happening in Poland? I mean, my readings through the history books have not turned up a source, but that may just be ignorance. Um, is it possible, is it linked to the increasing repressiveness of Gamulka's regime after its opening liberality? Uh, I simply don't know. And well, that's unfortunate for my lecture this evening, but it does mean that there is so much more important research to be done on this subject. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Pepper. Um, uh, because you mentioned um, Leger and Picasso, I just um, I will just tell you a little anecdote. Because in 1948, uh, there was a famous well, famous there was a World Congress in in Wrocław in the uh, south west of Poland, uh, and uh, the two guests of honor from the artistic side were Picasso and Leger. They both came. Actually, Picasso uh, flew for the first time in his life uh, uh, to uh, to Poland. Uh, before he he always he always said he would never fly in his life, and he did uh, one time. And the funny thing about this thing that uh, because they were these two great competitors in a way, uh, Picasso was a huge star. Leger not, and he got so furious he left after the first day. But one of the reasons why he was not successful, because for, for the Polish people, he looked too much like uh, Karl Marx. And they said, <laughs> we better have Picasso. So this is just to give you a little anecdote. And now we are moving to the third speaker, right? Uh, so it's Dr. David Enfam. And uh, uh, David is, is Managing Director of Art uh, Exploration Consultancy, LTD, in London and senior consulting curator at the Clifford Stiff Museum in Denver. Uh, he has been um, uh, a, a professor at, uh, at Brande University and uh, was commissioning editor for the, for the foreign, fine arts at Fidon. Uh, he has written many books. Uh, I mean, among them are uh, um, a book about abstract expressionism, uh, Mark Rothko, works on canvas, uh, Catalogue Raisonné. He has curated uh, endless exhibitions and uh, what else? I guess uh, now it's your turn. <laughs> I think it's also uh, I think yes, I'm yes. Sure worth well. mentioning that David has together with Michelle have written for the for the Scare oh, yeah. publication. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to stand over there. Yes. Um, Clock's ticking, and uh, we're all looking forward to dinner. So I'm going to be quite brisk and try to uh, keep everyone awake in the meantime. Um, my title, if you can see it, Common Languages, Stefan Gierowski and the uh, Esperanto of Art. Well, I need to explain that a little bit because there are two different ways of looking at art. You can see it as a style, or you can see it as a language. And that's not quite the same. And I'll explain that in a moment and what the difference is. But I want to begin by thanking 
uh, Eduardo Gizzoni of Skira, for opening up my horizons. Uh, I've spent too long looking at American art. I've spent 40 years writing about American art, talking about American art, thinking about American art, and it's very important when you get beyond a certain age, you mustn't get fossilized. And art history itself tends to get fossilized. We've actually seen the history of art since 1945 dominated by the hegemony of the United States. And it's summed up in a title, and can you all hear me okay without this being up here? It's summed up by the title of Irving Sanders' book in 1970, Abstract Expressionism, The Triumph of American Painting. And it so happens that America triumphed in military uh, sense, it triumphed as an imperialist force, and it triumphed, therefore, well, mutatis mutandis, as a cultural force. Now, there's been a bit of a swing back, and that's epitomized by the book, um, by the uh, Francophone art historian, Serge Beau called How New York Stole the Idea of Modern Art. Well, that was interesting, it's highly controversial, but all it does is to focus on how the Americans basically ripped, ripped off the rest of the world and dominated it with the language, of, well, not the language, the style of abstract expressionism, the whole, uh, whole notion of abstract expressionism's freedom. What we haven't done is to look as closely as we should at the actual art being produced in Europe, outside America. And it's only recently that the tide has turned a bit. It was interesting because about three years ago, if memory serves, there was a small show and a slender catalogue called Abstract Expressionism Behind the Iron Curtain. And it was co-organized by Joanna Gravers, who's Romanian, and Helen Harrison. And it happened at the Pollock Prasner House and Study Center in Long Island. And what's quite interesting is we have a we have a cliche of Stalinist social realist art coming down literally like an iron curtain on the freedom of so-called abstraction. What's fascinating from that little show and the uh, slender catalogue is that there's a heck of a lot of artists through the 1950s, 60s, 70s, right up to the fall of the Soviet Union, who were actually painting in abstract expressionist styles. I hardly heard of a single one of them, but it was a revelation. And because Natalia and Lucas were very insistent upon getting me to come to Poland, that opened up my whole perspective on Polish art, a whole new area. I'd heard of Stefan Gierowski, but I didn't really know the work. Now, Stefan died on the 14th of August last year, and I've been putting off this trip to Poland, I don't know, deadlines, this, that, and the other, COVID and all that. But eventually I went, or to put it another way, I set a date for going. And I arrived in Warsaw, where I hadn't been before. I'd been to Krakow, but not Warsaw. I arrived exactly 20 days after Stefan sadly died. Now, in theory, this should have been a very mournful, lugubrious trip, given the artist's death. It wasn't at all. It was a trip full of excitement, discovery, and joy because when I went to the foundation in Warsaw and also got taken to uh, Stefan Gierowski's last house where he lived in, slightly outside the uh, Warsaw in the country in a spa town, I'd never seen anything like it. You have this artist who begins numbering his paintings with Roman numerals in 1957. He does a thousand paintings between 1957 and 2000 and, uh, well, you know, 2021. And that's a heck of a lot of work. And I was simply astonished by the sheer range and diversity. And you see, I'm going to play the devil's advocate. And I'm going to speak out against what I call abstract expressionism, abex, according to short. Okay, there's Rothko here, there's Barnett Newman there. These abstract expressionists saw their art as a kind of a style, as a projection of the self. 
Clifford still said, all my paintings are self-portraits. Barnett Newman said, the self, terrible and constant, is my theme. They saw the self as being projected into their abstract styles. And Rothko was exactly the same. He saw his paintings in humanized terms. Well, and here I'm being a devil's advocate, it's very easy for a signature style, Pollock swung paint, Klein's big slashing black and white works, Barnett Newman zip stripes, Mark Rothko's hovering um, <laughs> rectangular color spaces. They can very easily become a straitjacket. And what I like, and I'm, I'm, I'm talking from a very, very uh, party free perspective, because once you've seen 850 Rothkos, you begin to feel that, in a sense, Rothko was in a kind of straitjacket. I sometimes joke, and I say, well, why didn't Rothko paint some circles for a change? Why didn't Barnett Newman paint a diagonal? They're stuck. And that's part of the power of their work, too, but it's also, it's also very, very restricting. But as you see, Gierowski, these panels here, they're all actually all different. And when, I, when someone asks me, people always ask me what I'm doing and working on at the moment. And it wants to really be very guarded, especially in academia. And I'm not in academia, thank God, because otherwise they'll steal it. But I, I was quite honest. And I, I said to um, a New York artist, and it's not too perfect at all, someone else, it's a senior, very well, now retired artist, and I said, Stefan Gierowski. He said, who? And then I sent some JPEGs. And he said, well, this guy must have been looking at Newman, Rothko, Albers, Alitsky, Nolan. Morris Lewis and all that. And I said, I don't really think so. I think he was really just discovering what he could do with the syntax of art. And the syntax of abstract art really comes down to something very simple. And it's, it's a title of a famous book written by an abstract artist of the First World War wave of abstraction. Point, line, plane. And just like the 24 letters, of the uh, English alphabet, so the English American alphabet. You can do a zillion things with them. It can be Chaucer, it can be Homer, it can be Shakespeare, it can be James Joyce, it can be whatever you like, Thomas Pynchon or Raymond Chandler. But they're all done out of 24 letters. That's the whole thing. Now, can we have an next slide, please? Oh, uh, Natalia, the slide meister. You see, this is um, one year after he starts to use Roman numerals. There's something rather interesting about Roman numerals. Could you go back a second, Natalia? Um, I, ca I can never get it right. This is 180, but I get the C's mixed up with the L's and the M's and all that. But the thing about Roman numerals, and I looked this up today, is they had no numeral for zero as a placeholder. And that's quite interesting because uh, Gierowski is sometimes associated with so-called zero movement in Europe. But from zero, what's the flip side? It's infinity. And Gierowski in his art is very much taken up with infinite permutations and changes in the same way that language, although based on a very small number of, well, phonemes and so on, it can go anywhere. And... Um, this down here, like two reverse Cs, Romans did have a sign for infinity. And it was that sign there, two C shapes like that. And so the notion of the infinite, which is very central to the paths to the absolute, which the first wave of abstract artists, uh, Mondrian, Kazimir Malevich, and Kandinsky, this sort of art is sort of going on into infinity. It was opening up wholly new spaces. The next one, uh, please. And you see, when I saw this painting, because I'd been brainwashed by looking at so many Rothkos, I thought, well, this is 58. I said, just, just after one year after he starts to number the paintings. And numbering obviously presupposes permutations. One, C, hundred, L, M, thousand, and so on. I thought it must be a Mark Rothko multiform influencing this. Very unlikely, very unlikely. Don't forget, Gierowski never went to the States. He traveled to Paris and around Europe, but basically I think his isolation within a Polish context 
allowed him to be extraordinarily original. And my core theme is that if you're really experimenting with the syntax and the semiotics of art, you can do it in your own world. But what happens because there is a limited syntax, point and line to plane and field, color and space, because of that, you get commonalities. Artists who do not know each other at all, but produce surprisingly similar looking paintings. And it's not a question of a race of who did what first either. So I don't think Mark Rothko, no one's going to look. By the time, um, everything okay out there? Uh, by the time Gierowski does his painting in 58, Rothko's multiforms were not known, hardly. They were only shown to Betty Parsons in 1949, 1950. But um, these were known until really after the big MoMA show of 1961. And there's something else very interesting. You see, this artist is also this artist, and he's chameleonic. You can go into all sorts of different ways. And I was absolutely, my eyes were opened in a way that I haven't been for a very long time. And here you see he's, he takes his place in a long tradition of some painters. It goes way back to medieval illumination. But it also goes very interestingly, and in since we're in Milano now, Giovanni Palizzo da Volpedo del Sole. It's like the sun is iconic because it's universal. It's not just a symbol of light, but it's also a transmitter of light. And I see these paintings in a way as an analysis of light. Light can be two things. It can be particles or it can be waves. Waves are lines and particles are effectively divisionist. An Italian division here, divisionism here, you know, Sarava, Doc Pedro and all that. Well, and of course, don't forget, I think that Stefan was very much um, aware of a scientific world. And it was in 1905 that Albert Einstein said, life, light can be both a particle and a wave. And it's that diversity which allows Gierowski to treat light in so many different ways. Could we have the next one, please? And I wrote some notes down and I'm only going to try to read them out because it's funny, I want to be talking about light. Um, in the last three weeks, I've had operation on this eye and an operation on this eye for cataracts. And at last I can see again, and, and it's eye opening art anyway. <laughs> um, a work like this, astonishing work. I, I, I searched for something I could compare it with in American art. I couldn't find anything. A bit of Jack Walkoff up here. Jack Walkoff was a sort of, uh, not second generation, but a less famous Abex artist and Pollock Newman Rothko and all that. A bit, but it's not the same. And what's interesting with Gierowski, it's not just the configurations that change, it's actual facture, the way paint's applied. In reproduction, before I went to Poland, I got the impression that all Gierowski's paintings were fairly smoothly painted. But when I saw this close up, this is how this is painted, really fat and pastel, and it's really gutsy. And the only person I can think is remotely similar, and they wouldn't have known each other, John Hoyland's late work is very, very gutsy as well. And they're both, they're both ultimately involved with Colour taken to its most extreme. I mean, it's really explosive. Next slide, please, because I'm going to try to be very quick. Gierowski up here, dealing with a void framed by colour. You see, you can have paintings, once you've got your syntax right, you can either have paintings that are immensely full, like the last one on the left, or paintings which are voided. The fullness and the void, the field and the void, the flip sides of the same coin. It's like just like language, yes and no, up and down. And I thought, well, I can't find anyone who really in America is the same. But Joe Bear, she's a non, or she, well, she's still alive, actually. I've met her. <laughs> she repudiated abstraction when I met her, and she said, couldn't do any more abstract art at all. She went figurative. But Joe Bear sort of, 
affiliated with minimalism, but not quite fitting into anything. And you can't see it terribly well here, but she paints in the 60s. She paints white, voided, luminous fields with colour around the edges. That's not so much a frame, that's actually colour, red, blue and green. But Gierowski wouldn't be looking at Joe Bear, and Joe Bear would never have heard of Gierowski. The fact is that the commonalities spring from using the syntax, the language of art itself, a point, line, plane, colour, light, space, and so on. And crucially, don't look to America, look back to Poland, because Vladislav Straminski, I hope I'm pronouncing it right, I'm probably not, astonishing artist. I took a day trip out, thanks to uh, the foundation to uh, watch, where, which was very much a centre for uh, Straminski. And Straminski is doing these amazing fields all over way before Jackson Pollock or Janet Sobel or even Ad Reinhardt. And his, his, his movement, his, what he calls it, is unism, composition. And this is why I have to put my glasses on to try to read from, um, from his 1928 text, Unism in Painting, Stravinsky writes, every square centimeter of a painting has the same value. Well, that is Clement Greenberg's all overness of the 1940s and 50s. We're all over painting, Mark Toby, Pollock. But Straminsky, he's already got it in 1928. And with these all over dot paintings, don't look to Larry Pones, don't look, don't look to any of the Americans, look back to Straminsky. And that Straminsky is a really first wave of abstraction again. So I think it's a mismatch to try to tie Gierowski to American post-war painting. They may look the same, but they come from very, very different roots. And the last slide, please, Natalia. And um, we're, in, we're in Italy, we're in Milano, and we're... Um, we're in the city where the Archivio di Piero Durazio is, up that part of Milano. Durazio is a one artist who seemed to me incredibly resonant with Gierowski. And it's quite interesting because Gierowski stays apart in Poland, doesn't go to America, doesn't meet Jackson Pollock, doesn't meet Morris Lewis, Kenneth Nolan, Jules Zelitsky, whereas the Durazio is the exact opposite. He knows everybody. He goes to America. He's teachers in Philadelphia for 10 years. And yet they come out with rather, rather similar languages. And you see, this is what I mean by commonalities in abstract art. You've got your vertical, you've got your horizontal, you've got your dots. Nolan deliberately looks back to Mondrian. Stella. Durazio, it's a, a, one is a take on the other there. That's, that's an unusual situation. But it's like, a, it's like different languages all molding together. And the key quote, to my mind, about Gierowski is actually made, not intentionally, but it's made as a key to what I'm talking about by Durazio. When in 1998, Durazio writes, the visual language like musical or verbal language, has its own set of rules, its own economy, its own entropy, and implies an infinite number of combinations of its elements and of probable versions or inversions. It is all there, like the 24 letters of the alphabet, the plane, the point, the line, the color, the void, and the field. And they can be permutated, just like the binomial system with computers, noughts and ones. They can be per per permutated and reconfigured infinitely. And I want to end on an interesting note. This chap up here, you've probably never heard of him, Liza Zabango, born in Warsaw, 1859. But you all have heard of why he's famous. He's the inventor of Esperanto. And Esperanto is to language what abstraction is to art. It's a universal language. And those and Esperanto is a mixture of all sorts of different bits of language. 
and that's why it aims to be universal. And quite interestingly, the very word Esperanto means one who hopes. And you see, Abex was a treasure card. The first wave of abstraction, Mondrian, Kandinsky, Malevich, was an optimistic art. It looked to an infinite future of space, line, plane. And Durazio, what, what I love about Durazio is what I also love, and not just the grids, the diagonals and all of that, the labyrinths. And this is, this is um, the Arati here, almost his own man. What I love is that it's an art of joy and hope. It's not a tragic art. It's not a cynical Jeff Koons, Duchamp-based type art. It's an art which leaves itself open to the future possibilities of art itself and hope. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, David. And uh, thank you for uh, being Patience and uh, patient and interested. I, I think it's fascinating the the story that unveils um, two little um, the, uh, I guess comments. One uh, you mentioned Lodge or it's Łódź in Poland yeah. uh, in Polish, right? Uh, it's and not many people know that uh, this was the second uh, collection of abstract art in the world. The first was in Hanover and the second was in Łódź. So that collection is fantastic as you, you saw it, right? It's yeah. It's terrific, actually. Right. And um, one point here, just before you go on talking. Right. We talk, I, mean, yeah. I won't talk at yeah. all, but very interesting because I'll be honest with you. When I think of Poland, I think of horror. The horror of the Second World War. The greatest evil that's ever been known in the history of dancing even worse than Stalinism. And yet, this wonderful joyous art is done against that very dark backdrop. Right. And I went to Lodge. Oh, I, I, I <laughs> Lodge. Yeah, <laughs> well, there, all I could think of was the, the ghetto, right. the journal of the uh, right. watch ghetto. And yet, there's the art. That art soars above it. Right. And there is another also speaking about that issue uh, about Zamenhof, because uh, the Esperanto language was uh, invented by him uh, in Bialystok. But, uh, you know, he was Jewish. And my my uh, take on it that, you know, this was the time when the Jews in Poland were in difficult position. And he was trying to create a language that would transcend the differences and uh, sort of bring people together regardless of their kind of political or cultural backgrounds. So that's that's about Zamenhof, just a footnote. But OK, we go because otherwise uh, we will be sleeping here, I think. Also, uh, Michel Gauthier uh, is our last speaker, uh, a curator at the Pompidou Center. Uh, um, dealing with post-World uh, War II painting uh, and sculpture. Um, I won't mention all the names of, uh, of artists that uh, uh, whose shows you curated, but uh, you have been also involved with, uh, with the Giroski Foundation and with, uh, with Stefan's work. Uh, so you, you curated an exhibition uh, in Poland, uh, which uh, I think it was very interesting because it kind of put a different perspective on the work of uh, somebody who in Poland is quite well known. And uh, also you included him in, in other contexts, in other exhibitions, which is wonderful. What else? And uh, I guess you will be speaking about this expanded field of uh, uh, sort of associations between uh, Gierowski's works and the works of artists who you have been uh, dealing with and writing about and curating. So uh, here you go. Thank you, Mark. Maybe we can. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. First of all, I I would like to to thank the Stefan Gierowski Foundation. Thank you, Natalia. Thank you, uh, Lucas, uh, for organizing this uh, this event. I would also like um, to say to my colleague uh, how much I enjoy being uh, uh, with them 
and to speak about uh, Stefan Gerovsky. I would, before um, starting with my lecture, I would um, I would add that uh, I last saw Stefan uh, in April uh, in Warsaw, and the last image um, I keep of him uh, is a sound image. When I arrived at his home, uh, he was in his studio singing uh, while drawing. Well, last spring, uh, here in Milan, um, at Depart Gallery, in an exhibition entitled Il Senso uh, dello Spazio, la Scelta della Luce, uh, and whose purpose was uh, to make Stefan Jarosky dialogue with three Italian artists, Lucio Fontana, Mario Nigro, and Piero Dorazio. Uh, um, I showed uh, this paint. between 62 and 68, that had been the subject the previous year of an important exhibition at the Sachenta National Gallery of Art in Warsaw. Another reason I wanted to include this painting in the Milan exhibition was that it condenses most of the dominant features of Gerovsky's poetics. Let's have a look at this painting. Between two forms, worked in an inverted gradient, a slot that widens downwards reveal a narrow part of a black circle. A thin horizontal yellow band seems to pass under both forms, but does not appear in the central slot. I don't know how Gerovsky's painting were received by the visitors of the 68 biennial, which crowned Bridget Riley, Nicolas Schoeffer, um, Gianni Colombo, and uh, Pino Pascali. Uh, I have to mention that Stefan uh, was not allowed to, uh, to come to, uh, to Venice for, the, for this exhibition. Uh, as Joachim said, this uh, biennial was disrupted by demonstration and political uh, protest cum culminating then in, in Western Europe. This composition uh, is very unusual and complex. Complex. You may have to go back to František uh, Kupka, maybe, to find such complex structures with such layering of plants and such a cosmic connotation. Next, please. This painting is all the more complex because it changes according to the way your eye will prioritize its components. If you choose as a central object of your vision the two vertical shapes, you will be struck by the chiaroscuro that affects them in a symmetrically inverse way. If your eye uh, focuses on the central slit and the black uh, uh, circle that it lets glimpse, you will be sensitive to the depth of field of this abstract image. If your gaze concentrates on the two black arcs on the side and the horizontal lines that crosses them, then the dynamic dimension of this painting will be revealed. Light, special depths, and dynamics, these are the characteristics of this painting and of the paintings that Dierovsky showed in Venice in 68, and perhaps even the entire poetics of the artist. Let's start with, with what is perhaps the least, the least striking uh, uh, in, in this painting. I mean the horizontal, the horizontal line, or more precisely, 
those two pieces of line that your eye connects to form a single line. You know that in um, 59, the line became the central element of Gierowski vocabulary. It marked the end of his informalist period. Next, please. Look at this painting, the painting uh, 97, in which on an uneven ground with small impasto, typical of Gierowski informalist manner, an oblique black line from outside the painting seems to point to the circumference of a disc with only a very thin arc visible along the upper edge of the canvas. The composition suggests a trajectory and the imminence of contact. A few years later, a very similar composition reappears in, uh, this, in the painting 175. But this time with effects of light and shadow as well as a chromatic palette that give it a cosmic dimension. Next, please. The kineticism of the Gryovskian line also manifests itself in a spectacular way in superlative paintings such as this one. We, we have already uh, seen this, this painting, or this one. Yes, next, please. With both sides of, uh, of, uh, of, the, of the painting, yeah. Next, please. In this painting, the two fragments of line also have a dynamic virtue, albeit more discreet. They serve to provoke the push of the two black discs toward the interior of the pictorial field. The kinetic potential of two discs is further accent accentuated by the gradation from dark to light of the two line fragments. Dynamic, the line is also luminous. The line at Gierowski works, in Gierowski work is a ray of light, of light. This ray crosses all the work by Gierowski, for instance, next please, in 68 and in 83. But light does not occur in Gierowski work only in the form of a light ray. Next please. As the two vertical forms in this painting show, chiaroscuro treated in a gradient is also the means by which light is manifested in uh, Gierowski's painting. The upper part of the form on the left is plunged into darkness and its lower part is illuminated. The opposite is true for the right-hand right form. Sorry. This light chiasmus generator of uh, strong tension is found several times in the work of Gierowski. It is, for example, also present in uh, the painting 223, uh, a painting uh, I'm proud to, uh, to, to mention that this painting is included in, in the collection of, uh, of the Pompidou. Next, please. When you look at a painting by Caravaggio, the effects of light and shadow are inscribed in the space of representation. When there is no representation, the chiaroscuro becomes disturbing. What light is it about? From where does it come? Some artists, in order to naturalize this chiaroscuro, have given a representative dimension to their abstractions. It is, for example, the case uh, in, next please. It's for example, the case uh, of Antoine Pevsner with his painting entitled Birth of the Universe. With Gierowski, the cosmic reference sometimes has the same function. Still, the chiaroscuro engender a strong feeling of speciality. I quoted Pevsner, but in the post-war period, abstract painting and chiaroscuro are not often associated. However, there are wonderful examples in Mario Nigro, one of the most captivating Italian painters of the period. Next, thank you. In this painting, from the Spazio Totale series, chiaroscuro is associated, as you can see, uh, with perspective and generates a very powerful sense of speciality. 
another of the great practitioners of chiaroscuro and chromatic gradation is a Jeff Varian. Next, please. A major player in the zero networks and probably the artist uh, closest to Lucio Fontana. They, they, they made together uh, some, uh, some pieces. In the 70s, Gierowski used chromatic radiation and light contrast in painting that no longer uh, uh, engage a cosmic imagination, but were nonetheless endowed with special depth. Next, please. This is the case with the painting 384. The chiaroscuro transforms the lateral bands into a background of uncertain special, special nature and makes the white rectangle float. Next, please. Basically, Gierowski is looking for the opposite of what many abstract painters of his generation, especially American ones, American formalists, have been looking for. Gierowski indeed does not seek flatness, but depth. Next, please. If the effect of shadows uh, and light can give depth to the pictorial field, um, the painting uh, number 191 uses for this purpose an other method, a central aperture revealing a more distant plane. Here, between the two curved form that chiaroscuro energizes, the more distant plane is occupied by a black disk. It sometimes happens, as you can see uh, uh, with the central um, image, that the disc seen through the aperture is colored. In other occurrences, the aperture remains blind, but the depth of the pictorial field is suggested by the use of perspective, as in the, in the painting uh, 652. Several artists have felt the need to create the sensation of space by opening the pictorial field towards a deeper plane, often presented as luminous. Next, please. It is the case in this 54 painting of Negro, one of the great achievements within the framework of Spazio Totale. Uh, the in, I, as you can see, the interplay of grids with receding lines that interlock with each other as they sink into the depths, open up in the lower part of the painting to reveal a beam of flight. Next, please. This is also the case in this painting by Aldo Schmidt whom specialists of the American scene may know since he was associated with Marsha Hafif in the late uh, 60s in Rome within the illumination group. Schmidt's solution in this uh, 73 painting is close to that adopted by Gierowski in several paintings. But of course, if one work had to be mentioned here, next please, it would definitely be uh, Lucio Fontana. In um, 58, he decided to make slits in the canvas, which in his mind opens painting to space, to cosmos. In the central slit, next, in the central slit of uh, the painting 181, it is a black, a black disc that it glimpsed. This disc is familiar to Gierowski. You know now very well this image, thanks to David. Uh, it appears as early as in as 61 in, in a painting of the very end of the informalist uh, period with the line that crosses it. This circle is, of course, an elementary uh, uh, geometric figure, as, uh, as you said. It's also, uh, it has also a special place in the cosmic imagination. The circle evokes uh, the planets. Perhaps more fundamentally, the disk is the most common image of the center, the focus of radiation. Next, please. In Otto Pino's work, even if it is black, uh, the circle is a sun, a center of radiation, a focus of energy. The same is true of Jeff Varian or uh, Francesco uh, Lo Savio, one 
of the most fascinating Italian uh, artist. Uh, but you know, he, he died very uh, young at the age of 27 uh, in, in, in Marseille, in, in, in France. And uh, his apartment, when where he committed suicide, uh, were in the Cité Radieuse built by <laughs> Le Corbusier. Well, it's, uh, it's another, another story. One of the few um, American artists active during the 70s and 60s who developed, next please, his poetics of radiation is Richard Pousset Darn, notably with his aptly named Radiance series, begun in, in the early, uh, in the early uh, 60s. Several of Gierowski paintings thus make the circle not a geometric, but an energetic uh, figure. Look, thank you, um, Natalia, look at uh, um, this painting uh, uh, several times shown uh, tonight. They are the colored rays diffused by the circle, but the circle itself is a place of an intense particulate activity, a chromatic matter in fusion that the eye never manages to uh, stabilize. As you know, black holes are celestial bodies whose gravitational field intensity prevents any radiation. In Gierowski painting, black holes radiate. To conclude, and uh, hoping, dear Marek, not to have been too long, uh, I would say that for Gierowski, choosing abstraction as you have probably understood, did not have to do with the desire to highlight the distinctive parameters of the, artist of the artistic convention known as painting, but rather to bring into play more fundamental categories such as dynamic, space, light, and color. Essentialist formalism, as defined by Clement Greenberg, is devoted to the exaltation of that portion of flat space, which, according to a convention forged by history, is the pictorial field. Whereas spatialism, luminochromatism, envisage the painting as a catalyst of a feeling of pure speciality and of an experience of light. I think two major trends can thus be distinguished in the most advanced abstract painting of uh, 70s, 60s, uh, and 50s. On the one hand, self-referential abstraction, which speaks of itself and its own codes. On the other, an abstraction that is less interested in itself that in some categories that transcend the pictorial phenomenon, space or light, for example. Stefan Gierowski, uh, is obviously part of the of the second trend. So, from now on, when we talk about this major trend is abstract painting, let's not forget to mention Gierowski's work. Thank you. Well, thank you so much to all of you for those. Uh terrific uh, presentations. Uh, I guess, um, you know, in the late 19th century, Alfred Jarry wrote um, a book called Ubu le Roi, the King Ubu, and, uh, and it begins with en Pologne, c'est-à-dire nulle part. In Poland, it means nowhere. I guess Poland is everywhere tonight, so it's a uh, it's a big, big change. And uh, I don't know how much energy you have to keep going. I, I guess we can have a, a brief discussion at least. Uh, uh, my, I had many questions, but one question which I, I think uh, comes out from these presentation is, uh, in your opinion, why has it taken so long for Gierowski to be discussed like we discuss him today? So that's a big question, but I think since you are coming from three big centers, uh, New York, Paris, London. How do you see, how do you understand that that kind of uh, time that we have taken to to discuss him like like we, we are doing here? 
I think we are lazy, you know, uh, and curators of uh, uh, big institutions are, are lazy. And I think it's due to the fact that during the Cold War, uh, for the artists emerging during this period, we uh, we didn't receive a lot of information uh, 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 about them, so it it will it will take uh, uh, some time because we have to rewrite. Uh, it's very pleasant and very uh, uh, it's very great to uh, to to be the actors uh, as critics, as art historian, and as curator to be the actors of this of this moment of art history. I think now we have to rewrite uh, uh, this period of uh, of art history, but in including new characters. But uh, I think it's it's due to the fact that we didn't get uh, many in much information about the artist uh, working uh, uh, on the other side of the Iron Curtain uh, during um, several decades. It's a um, very good question, Moak. And I think I will put it and, um, in a powerful form. You know the novel In Invisible Man? Yeah. By Ralph Ellison, a great black novelist. Class, race, gender, create, mass, invisibility towards some things. You see, take London. I can't walk down Tottenham Court Road without seeing someone begging in the street. Now, if that had happened 40 years ago, you'd call the police or a hospital or something like that. But now, as exactly as it's been in America for many years, those people are invisible, just as the blacks were invisible, just as to some extent the Jews were invisible. They were put out in the ghetto and that was it. There was a wall behind them. So um, it's a kind of mass, let's say mass amnesia in a way. And it's all very well talking about the woke generation and all, all of this. But my question is almost the same as your question. Why has it taken people so long to see what's in front of their faces? Poland's been around for a very long time. People of colour have been around for a very long time. Women have also, um, unsurprisingly, been around a rather long time. But they're invisible, like the servants were invisible. And I think, in a sense, take that to an aesthetic and cultural level. It's that kind of mass, um, um, it's a word I want, but I can't quite think of it. Mass invisibility. You, you don't want to see them and don't exist. And now we're, we're at least starting to realize that the reality, is, uh, reality is immensely diverse and things which we didn't bother to look at, we can now start to rediscover. That's, that's a very profound point. I, I, I would argue, however, that the situation about the, the invisibility, not just of Polish abstraction, Italian, Francesco Lo Savio, the French counterparts, all these things seemed invisible <clears throat> until 10 or 15 years ago. But I think the narrative, you referred to Serge Guibault's very influential book, the narrative that it's all because of the Cold War, that the State Department and the CIA were so successful in promoting American art in the 1950s and the early 1960s that it wiped everything else off the map. That's simply not true. I mean, yes, they were busy promoting American art, but there was tremendous awareness of art from Europe, from Poland. I mean, as I mentioned, you know, the Museum of Modern Art, the, supposedly the center place of the conspiracy to promote American art, was busy doing shows of Polish art and Japanese art and all, art from all over the world in the early 1960s. The, what, what seems, and I'm saying this based on looking, say, at art magazines and exhibitions, 
I think there was a kind of amnesia that descended, at least in the United States, in the late 1960s, after the big CIA effort, after it was exposed. I mean, there's a particular moment in 1966 when Rampart's magazine breaks the news. What Serge Guibault rediscovered years later was actually on the front page of the New York Times in 1966, that the CIA was supporting a whole bunch of cultural activities. Weirdly, it's at the time when the CIA efforts come to an end that Americans start to forget about everything except themselves. And the narrative that it's all about American art and all about Clement Greenberg gains extraordinary power to the point where even today, when I read French critics, people who are, or European critics, people who are trying to break the myth of American hegemony, they all quote Clement Greenberg as if there were no other critics, as if there were no French critics, as if there were no other critics in the United States, which there were plenty of. Um, and I don't really know how did this happen? How did the United States convince not just itself, but in effect the whole world that American art was the most important thing, Some starting sometime in the late 60s and carrying on through the 70s? And I do want to add that the Pompidou, your efforts and the efforts of your colleagues, has done an extraordinary job since its opening in the late 70s of reversing that trend. Mm -hmm. That I think that not just with the show we discussed, Modernité Plurielle, but from the beginning, the Pompidou has shown European abstraction. And I know over the decades, as I've gone back repeatedly and seen what's on view there in the Change, you know, the permanent collection, but it's an installation that changes, that I've had my eyes opened over and over and over again. You know, say this Pierre Soulage, who I used to think of as this French guy who looked kind of like Franz Klein. And now I see Pierre Soulage as, you know, an immensely great artist and Klein looks a little like Soulage. So, you know, hats off to the Pompidou for changing the way we see the world. Well, there was... Uh... Uh, I think speaking about the institution, there was a big show uh, called Présence Polonaise in uh, the Beaubourg. It was in the mid 1980s, and I, I don't know if Giroski was part of that show. It was uh, a very complex show because it was originally scheduled for 1981. Then we had the political change, and uh, most of the exchange, international exchange, was stopped for several years. Then it opened, I think, 84, 85, and it was these two groups, one which was uh, sort of Szyminski, the, the artist that you mentioned, more constructivist, and the other one was uh, Bitkatsi, who was uh, an, uh, an expressionist artist. And I remember Yves Lambois reviewed that show in Art in America, and he he liked very much Cheminsky, he liked very much abstraction, but he hated, he hated Vitkatsu. And for 20 years, nobody wanted to talk about Vitkatsu. Now he's back, you know, because things have changed. So, so that's that shows also how things can be uh changed uh, by even one review. And uh, you know, things I think Yeroski was not included, and I don't know why, you know, that would be probably interesting to know why because there, you know, I, I guess the space was limited, but it was a huge show. It was a show of, of, of more than 100 artists, I think, all right? So my my other question, which which I'm, I'm, I'm kind of thinking about this because we, we, we talk about uh, light, we talk about line, we talk about those uh, formal issues, but for me, it would be interesting to, to think about how much sort of religion in a way contributed to this kind of universe that he created not not just like abstract spirituality but religion which as i mentioned when when joachim spoke that was uh, the the catholic church was a huge power uh, you know that was one of the things that people kind of neglect because we talk about the political regime but we don't talk much about uh, the the catholic church how present it was uh, you know in the 60s and 70s and 80s and so on and uh, girovsky in a way making that exhibition in 1980s right when when art moved to churches actually kind of responded to that uh, situation right political not 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 religious situation so how do you think uh, is is there a way to read him in, in those terms or is it too 
is it too presumptuous or maybe too too far-fetched i don't know uh well i i think religion is a twofold factor when it comes to art because you can have art which directly reflects a kind of religion and the buzzword now is helma af clint right. you know she did it all before anyone else got round to it because of her religious spirituality but the other powerful way of looking at it is to see abstract art as a surrogate theology and i think that's that's something that's driven a lot of artists both on both sides of the atlantic and well, elsewhere what kind of theology sorry i missed a word there what kind of theology an abstract theology ah, okay. yeah abstract theology an abs it's an abstract theology and a surrogate theology surrogate yes surrogate that's the mm -hmm. thing it's instead of god you've got the absolute I thought we'd go in order. <laughs> Actually, that's such a good question. And Michelle, it makes me think of some of the qualities you were discussing under the the heading of chiaroscuro or gradated light. And something that struck me looking at the images in your presentation is that whereas chiar gradation in traditional painting in figurative art molds things in three dimensions. It makes you feel that they're turning in space. And that happens a little bit in Gierowski's work. Mm -hmm. But what I think happens more is that it makes you feel that something is moving, that the... Yeah. Well, certainly, that's certainly one angle of death books. But the other thing which came to mind when you were talking, um, um, you know, <laughs> you know, as you know, I'm always going to say, I'm going to say, I'm going to say, I'm going to say, I'm going to say, or bent space mm -hmm. seems to me to be not so much theological but scientific so, mm -hmm. because don't forget you've got the initial theosophical factually about the fourth dimension which is a huge field in the first wave of abstraction malay which a black square disappearing into another dimension yeah. but then in reality You've got all the different types of space which science discovers. And quoteless like Einstein, who predicts that light will be bent by gravity. Mm -hmm. And he, he only did that out of mathematics. It was only when he finally observed the vast gravitational mass of one of us, I don't know, planets or whatever, Jupiter or something like that, actually bent light. So I think um, there's a lot coming out of science. Yes. Um... Gerovsky uh, say that uh, he was really, really influenced by the uh, uh, scientific research. Really. No, it's going to make me an enemy, but never trust what artists say. <laughs> <laughs> That's wow. part of their artistry is to discover it. Yeah, yeah. So there might be a yes no, 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 no. another way of looking yeah. at the life in, in his work. You know, if you think about the chiaroscuro implies the, the sort of light is from outside, right? Yeah. It's that, but there is the, the, the iconic light, which is different, it's from within the image, right? That's the, 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 the notion of icon, icons they don't have the light coming from outside, right? Yeah. You know, it's not the spotlight that illuminates space, right? Mm -hmm. It's a, it's a the space that generates light. 
And I think in, in, in Kurovsky, a lot of the paintings actually have that kind of iconic component, which is the light coming from within, not from outside. So, so it has not much to do with science, that's with the idea of, you know, how, how icons actually, and, and we, if we speak about Malievich, I mean, Malievich was uh, very much uh, influenced by icons, and the yeah. black square is the ultimate kind of icon that, uh, that, that we are not supposed to read as a square, but rather as a, as a sort of light that comes from, from the red corner in the, in the house, right? Yeah, sometimes the light is coming from inside and some, sometimes from outside, but uh, in both cases, uh, uh, you have a feeling of, of special depth, you know, of, uh, of speciality. That's right. what I try to point out. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's more for me, it's a, it's a conceptual kind of uh, thing. It's not even it's not about the construction of work, you know, physically, but it's about yeah. how you begin your, your process, mental process. And I think, you know, there are some similarities uh, in, in, in a short period of time, he, he almost looks like Novoselsky, and you probably don't yeah. know his work, yes. but yes, yeah. but he was very much interested in, in orthodox science, yeah. right? Yeah. So, so that's where you, you see how he, and, and you, you all pointed it very, very poignantly, I think that you know the, the, the discord is so deep in his uh, way of dealing with with the art of painting, right? What you know, call the language in a way, it's, it's more than the language, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, um, and also I think Kiarowski could be very pathetic of things to come because the creation of light spaces. You think immediately of Turrell, James Turrell. The sense of abysses opening up or radiating out, that's um, um, Anish Kapoor. That sense of the abyss and a sense of light coming out of it. And uh, Turrell's Road and Crater, you know, it's got this cosmological theme, light from sky, space, and occulted geometries. That's... Um, Stefan Gierowski is ahead of ahead of a curve there. Other artists will take it to a bigger, you know, more melodramatic setting in, in the real world, but within the universe of his painting, he's covering a heck of a lot of ground. It's also the changing of style, which uh, you, you also mentioned, you know, that he's so fluid in his... It, it might come from, from the fact that... Uh, that in Poland, uh, you know, there wasn't, there was no commercial kind of mark. Therefore, museums, like in the U.S., you know, I, I mean, most of the museums, when there was a Rodko and the Rodko became famous, everybody wanted that Rodko. You know, they didn't want a, a Rodko that you couldn't recognize. They wanted a Rodko. So there was a demand for that kind of uh, production. When as in Poland, where there was no uh, museums were basically uh, sponsored by the government and they were buying art they were going to art, the artist studio and choosing whatever they wanted so in some way there was no pressure to make the same image again and again because even if you change your style you know five years later the museum would come and buy your work right because that was part of the of the system that's how it works so in some way that 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 limited situation actually lack of uh, funding basically or very limited funding actually helped for artists to 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 be free and to experiment when as uh, sometimes in the west people were too bound to the idea that if i don't make that work and nobody will recognize it then 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 it's useless right so maybe we should i'm sorry i don't want to monopolize so maybe you have some questions because you've been so patient here for so long so uh uh, anyone? Uh, I guess, uh, as I said, it's it's so <laughs> overwhelming in a way. <laughs> and you've been fantastic because you know, I mean, to absorb that much of uh, information coming from you know a, a a place where you know we are we are already kind of fanatics in a way, so we can talk all night long. But for you, I mean, it's <laughs> it's 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 probably well. I hope you are fanatics too, but uh, you know. <laughs> Yes. 
we are all fanatics so, I mean that's what makes the evenings like this you know I um, go forever I remember you know I I, I had the privilege to go to Donetsk to Ukraine before the before the the war and there was a big show of uh, Tsai Guo Qiang I don't know if you, you probably know the Chinese artist who works with the fireworks and and I remember uh, I, I gave a lecture about contemporary art and it lasted seven hours uh, with people like you, uh, you know, young people who were sitting and there was no time. The time kind of disappeared, you know, so seven hours, not here. We are in Milan and we are not in Donetsk. <laughs> but, but anyway, I want, I want maybe you to, 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 to conclude with some kind of a, a brief statement and uh, we'll start with Natalia probably uh, since you've been quiet. Uh, from... Well, yes, because we agree that for the Q&A, I'm, I'm going to remain quiet and leave it up to the experts. But um, on the topic of the um, on, of the varied approach to, to his artistic language, I remember when David came to, to the foundation for the first time to see the paintings in, in real life after having written for the book. Um, he, I remember his remark saying that he can, it's very difficult to believe that all of these paintings come from the same artist. And it goes back to the points that you literally just made, which is um, because of the way he was secluded and the, the way that he created in this periphery that allowed him to explore all of the different ideas and all of the different themes and principles that I already told you about uh, in much depth and not get stuck in this consistent and little and narrow-minded I mean, not to not to offend the other artists who did that. I'm sure they they achieved incredible. Um, I mean, achieved incredible conclusions as well. But that allowed him to to become this extremely varied and extremely multifaceted um, artist that he is. Um, and that's why the the conversations tonight had been so long because there are so many elements that we can concentrate on. And with that. I'm sure everyone's going to be extremely delighted I hear that we are concluding tonight's show <laughs> and symposium. Symposiums are supposed to be long and uh, this one has lived up to it, its expectations. <laughs> Hopefully it was long enough. Um, yes, so I'll well, I, I already said more than I should have said. So, uh, so yeah, I, I let you finish, you know, three of you. Uh, just, uh, no, I, I, I was thinking about Stefan and the photos of him, which I saw, and a very beautiful frontispiece photo in the catalogue. And I'm terribly sorry that I missed him by 20 days, but I felt that I was meeting him through the paintings. And at the end of the day, we're in Italy, you should remember two things. Ars longa vita brevis. And given where we are, in vino veritas. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I have to say that in the case of Dorazio, he was a connoisseur of wine. And if you can be a connoisseur of wine, it bodes very well for being a connoisseur of color, light, and space. So let's bring on the wine. Yeah, Michelle, you all know. 